Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 26, Solidarity in Portland, Oregon, featuring Cami Pavasic. Cami Pavasic is an actor, director, producer, activist, and union thug. She has been attending the Black Lives Matter protests in Portland, Oregon, as a participant with the Wall of Moms. She was born in Denver, grew up in Idaho, earned a bachelor's degree at Boise State University, and attended the National Shakespeare Conservatory in New York City. She is married with one stepdaughter and two grandchildren. She directed the documentary, Add the Words, about the campaign to add sexual orientation as a protected class to the Idaho Constitution. You can find her on IMDb. On July 25th, Cammie and I conversed on the phone and started off about her 30 years of union organizing around the country. Regarding the protests in Portland, our discussion specifically focused on the efforts there to center people of color and Black Lives Matter, despite what the media might do. We ended by talking about her documentary. So this is something I wrote last night on Facebook, just to kind of give people an idea of what's really going on. Sure. So I took my, I took my husband to downtown Portland last night to show him the reality because he's been nervous about me participating in the protest. Two blocks of graffiti that cover the first floor of the Justice Center. There's no garbage, no fires, nothing you are seeing on TV. Thousands participate in the protests every night, peaceful until midnight. These protests are led by black leaders of the community. The news never covers their speeches and testimony. The news doesn't cover their message. Then the wall of moms lines up to protect those that are left because most protesters leave before 12 a.m. Then the 20-year-old anarchists come in. They are polite, and they thank everyone as they're leaving, and then they go to work tearing down the fences to bring in the stormtroopers. The stormtroopers raise war on anyone that's left. This is the dangerous time. This is the time America needs to see. This is the time when democracy is at risk. This is the time to remember that we should have been on the front lines for Black Lives Matter, for the water protectors, for the families in cages. In the morning, volunteers go in and clean everything up. It isn't chaos. There are no riots. It's a ballet of how to get the media to cover what is happening in the U.S. and to our democracy and to our black and brown brothers and sisters. Wow, that's a really nicely written piece. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I think that that really is sewing. Um, I mean, there is so much that doesn't come through on the media. I used to live in Portland, and I was there from 2001 to 2010, and I did a lot of indie media reporting in the earlier years of that, 2001 and 2005. So I'd be on the streets, you know, all the time covering things and then I'd get back and I'd see how the Oregonian had covered it or K to you or whatever. And it was like, were they in a completely different city seeing something completely different because their coverage would have so little to do with what had actually happened. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they're talking about riots. There are no riots and um, people shouldn't have to be gassed because of spray paint. Um, and most of the spray paint even now is on the boards that have been put up to protect the building. Um, it's just, it's very dystopic, I think. <laughs> right. With, uh, you know, this doesn't seem real. Right. Now, how long have you lived in, the, in, in Portland? So I just, actually, I live in Vancouver. Oh, in Vancouver, um, sorry. But my whole family lives in Portland. So uh, my sister moved here first, um, I guess it was about 15 years ago, and then my um, my other sister moved here, uh, and then um, 
my parents moved here and then I wanted to be by the family. So eventually I moved here. So, um, that's how I got here. Right. And And I've been here for, um, three, three years now. Oh, that's great. And so, and you're working with, uh, public, um, employees union in the state of Washington. Yes. So, um, I first started out, uh, well, I started union organizing, um, 30 years ago. (laughs) Oh, great. Um, yeah. In, uh, what was that? 1990, 1990. So it's been exactly 30 years. Um, I started at HERE, uh, local 103, which was, um, I helped organize the rainbow room and then I helped organize the United Nations workers. So, um, then I got hooked. Uh, the rainbow room. <laughs> that's, a, a rain- that's a restaurant out there. It was uh, the 56th floor of the Rockefeller Center. Ah, that's right. Um, it, it, it's closed now, but, uh, you know, from the 1930s on, it was a really big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I got organized by the union, and then I started working for the union. And then most of my career, I've worked for SEIU in various places, um, uh, Oregon, uh, Washington and Colorado. I traveled a lot working for Change That Works, getting health care reform passed. And then I went to, um, when I came to Washington, I was working for 775 for SEIU, which is the home care workers. And uh, we had a huge Supreme Court ruling that was very devastating for the home care workers, which was called Harris versus Quinn. And um, that meant that we could no longer close shops for uh, health care worker or for home care workers. So um, home care workers could opt out, but the union still had to represent them and bargain for them. And it was a ploy by the Freedom Foundation in order to bankrupt unions. And the um then about a year later because it was two years ago we had um uh what was the lawsuit that we just lost i'm sorry (laughs) my brain's a little foggy um anyway there was a a second one on public sector unions uh that the freedom foundation filed for public sector unions all over the country and um they won and it meant that people could opt out and we could no longer close shops for public sector workers. When they did that in Washington, uh, what happened was uh, the movement, the union membership grew by 10% because people knew that they needed a union. Um, and then right before the Supreme Court ruled, I moved from 775 into Washington Public Employees Association because we had just been through this fight. And we, I had an excellent toolbox that I got from 775 in order to um, come in and help this small union survive the, um, oh, it was the Janus versus, Janus versus AFSCME. That was the case. Right. I remember hearing um, about that. Yeah, so I brought my skill set after working with 775, and we were able to survive. Um, We have, with public sector employees, we have a very conservative base, and especially on the eastern side of Washington. Um, So it took a lot of work to make sure that the union could survive that, but we did, and now our membership is growing. So um, I'm really proud of that. Uh, Some of the work that we're doing with uh, our mother union is actually USCW, which is the United Commercial and Food Service Workers. And, um, you know, they were very helpful, too, because they have a lot of grocery stores and uh, meatpacking plants in right-to-work states, which means that if you're in a right to work state, there are no closed shops. 
Um, a closed shop means that you have to join the union if you want to work there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then part of that is, you know, our our little union was a representational only union, and those are not strong unions, and they don't really exist anymore. And so another reason I came in was to help build the power of the workers and get them more involved with their union and get them to um, going back to the idea of the workers doing the work and having the power and running the union. And I think our little union is doing a great job and we're making a big impact. And uh, right now it's been really hard because Washington State is struggling. We don't have income tax. We only have a sales tax, which mm, is that's horrific. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's horrific on so many levels. We have to get those changed. Um, but, uh, you know, a rich person and a poor person are going to pay the same amount for a gallon of the gas. And that is why sales tax, are they're terrible. Um yeah, re- regressive, tax. they call that, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. <laughs> and we need to start talking about taxes as they're, um, they're an investment in the community. So when a company like Walmart comes in and doesn't have to pay any taxes, they cost taxpayers money because they have to build parking lots and roads have to be built and maintained in front of their stores. Um, their workers make very small wages. And so the community has to pay for uh, food stamps and housing supplements and stuff in order for workers to come in and, and um, be working at Walmart. So Walmart doesn't contribute to the community. Um, and we have to really start looking at taxes as an investment rather than a burden. And uh, we need to stop saying fair share because that still is a burden. If a company wants to do business in the community, um, and that includes an online community, they have to invest in that community. And I think we need to start talking about that. But in, in Washington State, it really put us in a crisis during COVID because Everybody went home and nobody's buying anything but food and food isn't taxed. Ah, uh, so, right. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, resources here are draining pretty rapidly. So we're seeing massive layoffs of public sector workers and huge furloughs being implemented. Right, and that's specifically what you've been dealing with lately as a union organizer is those those uh, furlough the uh, firings. Yes, and the furloughs. What's a, um, what's a furlough exactly? So a furlough is when uh, people are temporarily laid off. So it can be, let, let's take an example. Um, if, if a college says, okay, you have 12 furlough days, you can take those 12 furlough days together without pay, or you can take them once a month throughout the year without pay. And then that saves a certain amount of money for the college or for the department. Um, It's not very effective and it tends to hit uh, the lowest paid workers the hardest because they do cross the board furloughs. So when you have um, 12 days of furloughs, that's gonna hit a custodial worker way harder than it's gonna hit somebody who is like a, a middle management program specialist. Uh, if that makes sense. <laughs> right. No, it's going to hit the janitor harder than somebody in admin. Correct. Mm-hmm. And um, so, and the other thing is we have this shared work program with the federal government, but many of the colleges and the departments don't have enough human resource uh, power to participate. It's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of bureaucracy and stuff. And so, People just apply for regular unemployment instead of the shared work. And the shared work is, it's almost a matching of what people are losing. Uh, so we're really having to pressure our um, the departments that we represent and the colleges that we represent 
to make sure that they're using the shared work program, even though it's more work for them. <laughs> right. And they're dealing with furloughs too, you know? So, and then the, the unemployment office is dealing with furloughs at the same time where we have this extraordinary, extraordinary amount of people coming in to apply for um, unemployment. So it's, um, COVID has been a mess and the lack of help from the federal government has been horrifying. Oh, definitely. If, especially if you look around the rest of the world and see how other countries have been handling it. And of course, you know, there's been different responses in different places. But, you know, I, I spoke to someone earlier for my podcast who lives in France, and it was a very different story she was saying about what they did there. I mean, their government there was covering 70% of everybody's wages if they couldn't work. You know, they were doing this with the idea that, okay, you're not going to fire your worker because we're going to pay 70% of their wages. And so they had a uh, a much stricter shutdown, but they also had a lot more benefits. Uh, they also made it illegal um, for anybody to be kicked out of their housing, uh, et cetera. So they had, it, it was just... And they're not, you know, appreciably like a much wealthier country than the United States or something like that. It's just that they use their resources uh, differently than we do. Yes, yes. And, you know, I, I look at what's happening in Portland um, with the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, where there are no riots and things like that. And um, I have to... I'm very upset at where my taxpayer money is going because these military forces that are being sent in are, uh, they are special agents from the border patrol who get paid extraordinary wages because they have to, uh, they, they are trained in the military in order to deal with the big gangs and the firepower that the gangs have. And they've been launched on peaceful protesters. But the other thing are the private military mercenaries that they're using. These are people who don't, they don't um, take an oath to the Constitution. Um, they're just private contractors. And they make a lot of money. And so the fact that my tax money is going there to harm Black Lives Matter peaceful protesters instead of going to um, helping working folks and help reconstructing police departments that are fair and that are not murdering black people who are sleeping or shopping or, you know, just living their lives. Um, and this country is at a, we're at an apex and we get to decide now what we're going to look like in the future. And we have to talk about these things. And we have to talk about how racism, what happened at Standing Rock, and having families in cages, how that eventually trickles down to the fact that white people are going to lose their freedoms too. And we're watching that in Portland. Right. And so we, we should have been on the front lines long before this. This country has never really dealt with reconstruction after the Civil War, and it's time we do that. That's a very good point, and I, I hardly hear anyone talking about that. But reconstruction, of course, was never was never completed and was definitely um, halted on purpose by. At that time, it was the Democratic Party that was the party of the South, and the Republican Party was the party that was. Uh, at least in name, supporting black people. And it, at that time, it was the, the Democrats forced uh, the Republicans to withdraw the troops from the South and Reconstruction ended in like, I believe it was 1877. And so I think most people don't realize that something was really lost then and was only partially made up for during the civil rights era in the 50s and 60s of the 20th century. Right, and usually part of Reconstruction means that war criminals are held accountable. Uh, one of the things I learned about here and Battleground and why there's Confederate statues and flags at Battleground Park is that um, 
those generals who committed those atrocities against the United States of America were moved to the West Coast to fight indigenous people here. I and didn't know that. So, yeah, their reign of terror uh, continued here. And the, um, yeah, and, and then slave owners were given reparations. Uh, for losing their slaves, the slaves were never given reparations. And when you look at any time in this country where black folks have built any type of wealth, we've destroyed it. Whether it was mowing down a very successful black community to build Central Park, or you have the Tulsa riots, um, you know, we don't, we don't learn this stuff in history, and so we didn't learn from it. And then the other part that we're missing, if you look at Germany, um, you know, they don't have statues of Hitler everywhere, um, but everybody knows their heritage. Um, and uh, we forget in this country that those statues were not put up during the Civil War. They were put up during the Southern Strategy. That um, and Jim Crow, they were used as intimidation, and we have never, we still don't talk about that part of it. We just say, oh, these statues are being torn down. We don't look at why they were placed there in the first place. And I think if people knew that, we wouldn't have people pushing back so hard on the removal of them. Right. Yeah. There's. Anyway, there's, I'm sorry. I totally got off topic. With no, I, and stuff. <laughs> it, it, it's all. I, it's all related. That's the thing. I mean, how, how can we stay on topic when all the topics are are intertwined with each other? You know. Exactly, and I want to know how many white people, if their family was continued to be stripped of their wealth over and over and over again, where would they be? Um, we don't look at it in those terms. But, you know, to bring this back around, the president of WPA, his name is Kent Stamford. He is a rank and file member from Department of Natural Resources, and he's a black man. He's the first uh, black president that this union has had. Um, so he's, he's very good about, you know, social justice issues and what's happening um, on the front lines there. But I want to say that tying all this together, I think we have to talk about the policemen's union because we don't, the union community doesn't look at the police officers union as a union. Um, because first of all, they don't respect a strike line or a picket line. They will come in and beat up the people who are striking, who are picketing, and they will side with the bosses. Um, no other union does that. Um, they also will protect murderers. And I can't think of another union that would take to arbitration defending somebody who murders somebody. Um, and so, uh, you know, I want to be very clear that unions are not standing with um, the police officers union and many, many unions across the country are asking the AFL-CIO to remove police officers' unions from being part of the membership of the AFL-CIO. I hadn't heard about that effort yet. That sounds encouraging. Yeah, we're working on it. Baby steps, right? I mean, it's, we're talking about money and power, and police officers' unions have a lot of money and power. And, um, you know, so... Uh, that's a problem. You know, if I had, if I had a member who uh, murdered somebody, um, I, I would be telling them and advising them to throw themselves at the mercy of, of management and the courts. I wouldn't be defending them. Um, I would, and unless it was something that management told them they had to do and they felt like they had to murder that person because otherwise they would be fired. Then I might think about it, but I just, that's not the case with the police officers union. Right. And, uh, 
I am horrified because many, many people now are, we're starting, we only have 9% of unions in this country, 9% and 6% of those are public sector and public sector unions don't have a lot of power because they're, the employees are paid through taxpayer dollars. So it's not like, you know, the Kaiser, the Kaiser unions or the big, um, you know, Boeing and all these big corporate unions. It's not like that at all. But we have to remember as a country that unions will tell you the health of a democracy because unions should be the training places for democracy. Unions should be run by rank and file membership. The presidents of the union should be rank and file. Um, they should be doing the work of the unions. Democracy is hard work and very time consuming. And as Americans, we've totally gotten way too comfortable. And we think like, we'll just vote somebody in and they'll, they'll do everything for us. And now we're seeing where that's led to. And part of why Barack Obama can get the Employee Free Choice Act or some of the other like environmental protections and stuff that he wanted to get, or even single payer out of the healthcare reform is because people thought that he could just write an executive order and make this stuff happen rather than having huge social social movements behind the need for these things. And so unions now are even more important, I think, than they were in the 20s and 30s because now we have this point where people... <laughs> I mean, we had... We had lawmakers saying that children should be working as custodial workers and not the food lunch counters if they couldn't afford their meals. Um, so not only are we talking child labor, but we're talking free child labor. I hadn't heard that. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was crazy. It was crazy. Um, so, you know, we have to get back to looking at labor unions as a training ground for democracy. And the fact that we're down to 9% shows how, what dire straits our democracy is in that at this point. Right. And there's been a number of, uh, you know, you alluded to a couple of them, but there's obviously been legislation at all levels, I would expect federal and, and state that have been trying to make unions less powerful for the last generation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and really the Freedom Foundation, which is paid by the companies that belong to the corporate group that we know called ALEC, um, they're being funded by the Koch brothers, by Walmart, um, by these, by the big pharmaceutical companies, um, because we hold them accountable. And it's not just accountability to the workers. I remember one time uh, I was, uh, I used to work, um, I represented nursing homes in California with SEIU. And we were in San Francisco. We needed to get the um, workers to, to strike because we weren't settling our contract and we could not get them raises. We were asking for like a 20, 25 cent raise. And, uh, per hour and they wouldn't do it. And right when it happened, and this was, you know, over a decade ago, but right when it happened, the women who owned the nursing home, her apartment was being uh, featured in Home and Garden magazine. And she literally had gold toilet seats. Oh and my gosh. so we distributed flyers <laughs> with that on and we went on strike the next day and we got our raise. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of times, like workers, what people don't understand too is workers are so grateful right now in this country to have any work at all. And we're talking the lowest of low wages. Federal minimum wage is seven twenty five an hour. That's ridiculous. That's obscene. There are places there are places in Utah where home care workers uh, have been cut down. They got a special waiver by the governor and it went and got it. I can't even remember which president signed it. I can't remember, but I, I think it was Bush that signed it. Um, but they're allowed to pay 
some of their home care workers six dollars an hour. Oh. How do you live off of six dollars an hour? In the meantime, we're talking about someone like Jeff Bezos who pays minimum wage, um, who has, who will have in, I think it was 2023, a trillion dollars. No human being should have that kind of money. That is insanity. And, but we in this country are so busy fighting amongst each other. So when you look at the three percenters or the boogaloos or the proud boys, the people who voted for Trump, they're poor, they're angry, but they bought into the narrative that their jobs are being taken by immigrants, that black people are getting jobs that white people deserve because of affirmative action, all of these things that we know aren't true. We know when a black person gets hired, it was because they were the best of the best of the best. Um, and we're fighting amongst each other. Women are fighting against black men and black families because they've been destroyed. They've been so damaged. This country is severely traumatized by the way we've treated each other. And We've never dealt with that trauma. And so like Trump, Trump is a mirror of what we've done to ourselves. We have lived through so much trauma that now we are insane. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm glad you said what you said about, about Trump because I think, you know, he, too many people view him as being an aberration, but he isn't really an aberration. I, I find I grew up in Nebraska in a very red state, you know, and I look at him and I'm like, well, he's, he's pretty typical of a lot of uh, men that I grew up with, you know, and who still exist, you know, and of a whole culture, and including the, the women who support men like that. In a state of shock after the war. We interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Calibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Calibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. -L -L and now, back to our regularly scheduled... Yes, and if you look at, um, you know, <laughs> imagine this. Um, we have white women in a time where human white men owned other human beings. You're a white woman. You live with a man who owns, tortures, and rapes other human beings. This man has children that come out of those rapes with other human beings. This man will kill you if you say anything. So what does that do to a white woman's brain to make everything okay in her life and to sleep in that bed every night. And we don't talk about that. And we don't, we don't. And then if you look at, you know, white women and black men have been fighting and been pushed against each other for so long for that second tier under the men, white men with power. Like right. who has more power, white women or black men? This is where I think it's so important to look at black women as leaders. Right. Because they got nothing in that. They mm -hmm. were never promised a place at the table. And somehow, with all of the trauma and damage that we did to black women, they came out the other side with their souls. I don't know how that happened, but something happened. And I want to know what that is because I want that in my life. But I think we really need to look at black women to start leading us into healing this country. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And so can you talk a little bit about what you've been seeing uh, in, in, in Portland, um, not just on the streets, but in the situation in general um, on that topic? Like, for example, I know that Joanne Hardesty has really been saying some powerful things. 
Yes, and because I haven't been here long enough and I'm just new to the Wild Moms movement and stuff, I I don't know the names of people, and I'm so sorry for that. Oh, she's a city council um, of, member. Oh, yes, I know who she is. Yes, I totally agree with what she said, too, about um, the private military forces and things like that coming in. She had to walk that back, but that was unfortunate because she was speaking the truth. But I have to say that... Um, just so everybody's clear, because it's not on the news, Black Lives Matter women are leading. They are do they they are up there with the microphones. They are speaking to people every single night. The news is not covering them or their message. Um, Wall of Moms has of uh, Portland has just turned over all of their Facebook page and events to the black women leaders of don't shoot Portland and black lives matter because white women can be very problematic again, because of their damage and their privilege. It's a bad mixture. Um, but I have never in my life and I've been working on social justice stuff my whole life. My father was a freedom writer. My mother was the executive director of the Pacific Northwest. Um, Idaho or Head Start Association and she brought Head Start to Idaho and stuff so my parents have been on the front lines of a lot of this stuff for a very long time so we grew up with that in our culture Um, but uh, watching the white women on Wall of Moms in Portland has been amazing because the conversations that are happening on that page are just as important as what's happening on the front lines um, white women are learning, and I shouldn't be talking about this because I should be letting a, a black woman talk about this. So I apologize for white centering myself in, in the conversation about Black Lives Matter. But I want people to know that it is black led um, in Portland, and we are struggling. I mean, part of the idea of the Wall of Moms is we needed to get the press back into focusing on the Black Lives Matter movement and what was happening in Portland. But it, then it became about the white women in front and the sacred, special white women are being harmed. Unfortunately, that's what gets press. Um, and so there's a big struggle on how do we make sure that people remember who the real heroes are. We have to remember this started in Minneapolis. I mean, it started a long time ago, but in Minneapolis, there was a 17-year-old black woman black child who filmed George Floyd being murdered. And when he called out to his mother, all moms felt that. And moms are answering that call. And while of moms is not just white women, it's mostly white women. But um, now that it's being turned over to the black women leaders. And don't shoot Portland. If people want to donate or do something, you know, for the community, We have Don't Shoot Portland. The NAACP is holding family-friendly Black Lives Matter protests in the parks where there's not going to be any of the tear gassing. There's no police. You know, those are very peaceful, safe protests. Those don't get covered. Um, And those happen every day at 5 o'clock. You can donate there. Uh, donate to the Black Lives Matter movement, and then start donating to businesses. Like, let's say you want, uh, Riot Ribs got trashed. The feds came in and just trashed them. This is a group of people who feed homeless people and protesters. And uh, they tore up their tents, and they weren't doing anything. Um, Ruined their grills, pepper sprayed all their food and water, um, and decimated the business. Uh, Wild Moms put the call out, and they were rebuilt and back up the next day with more than they had before. So you can, even if you don't get a product from a black-owned business, right now in the time of COVID would be a really good time just to give them money. Right now, white people need to start giving black folks money, however they can. I'd heard a little bit about the Riot Ribs um, place and how it had been targeted. And one thought I had about that, you know, here they are targeting. Well, because we've heard the story about them targeting Riot Ribs. Then we heard the story about 
them, you know, pepper spraying medical supplies, you know, that were out there. And mm -hmm. then, you know, of course, the targeting of the legal observers and then the targeting of the media. And, you know, I guess that to me, I, I see this in the context of what is called total war, you know, and that's um, a concept that really came to be around the turn of the 19th, 20th century, where previous to that, civilians had kind of been left out of a lot of different battles, but they increasingly were brought in. And, you know, World War II is when the, you know, mass bombings of cities, civilian cities began, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, both the Germans doing this to, you know, the, the British, etc. But then also Churchill was a very um, enthusiastic about this himself. He was one of the people who really helped push that too. And so, this whole idea that when you're at war, you're targeting not just the other soldiers, but their whole supply system. And you're trying to bring the, the civilians, you know, you're trying to bring their spirits down. Well, that that is how the feds and that is how the Portland police are, are treating the people in Portland. OK, so let's take everything you say, everything you just said, which is so important and so spot on. And remind ourselves that black folks deal with that all the time, every day, for their entire life. Right? right? And so we're saying it's a total war now because white people are being harmed. But black people are being murdered and tear gassed and beaten and unfairly imprisoned for their whole lives for nothing more and the color of their skin, we have to keep bringing it back to that. So that every time we see, we want to share this tear for what's happening in Portland, we haven't shed that tear for black folks. And that is really awful. We need to reckon with that. Um, we really do. It's, Absolutely. It's, it's a horrible thing. And I want to say, too, that, like, you know, when, when you had reached out to me, we were going to talk about this. And I did put this back and sent it to the Wall of Bombs, sent it to um, the Don't Shoot Portland, Black Lives Matter, all that. However, they're very busy right now. And so they're doing what they can. Please keep reaching out to them because the Black voices are way more important than anything I'm saying. Because um, they have to live with this every day. And this is where we really fell down as white people. We always come in at the last minute and pretend to look like saviors. And it's really us that have messed it up all along. So it's not saving anybody. We have to fix this. There are still children in cages. Right. In this country. Yeah. And obviously this, this has been the history of our, of our whole country as well, you know, with the, all of the land that we're on, you know, having been stolen, you know, uh, through through genocide, much of it, much of it through government policy. And, and as you alluded to with the Confederate generals being sent out west to, you know, to, to kill the Native Americans. And so that I feel like I feel like the heavy the, the heavy burden of, of all of that, all of that brutal malice and all of that trauma is just weighing down at this point and it's where it feels as though it could actually even just really lead to a, a collapse of the of the whole experiment because it was never because it was it was founded badly to begin with there's never been a good moment you know no there really hasn't and the thing is too um the american experiment the idea of it the Constitution, and even though the founding fathers were slaveholders, um, that they didn't consider women and men and and people or uh, black men in that uh, in that piece of paper, but we do now, right? We consider that Constitution as sacred and something for everybody. We never invited everybody into that institution. And so rather than tearing down the institution, and I'm not talking about like the military institutions and, and systemic racism, those things need to be torn down. What I'm talking about is everybody gets equal public education. Everybody gets 
equal access to um, resources that we provide liberty and justice for everyone, that there are certain things in our country that are public and not private, like prisons, like education, like health care. Um, you know, senior citizens are just written off. I mean, we're watching all of these people who were like pro-choice, all life matters, turn around and say, yeah, it's all right if grandma dies. Or only 14,000 kids will die if they go back to school. Um, I, it, the narrative, the country, this country, and I, I mean this in the literal sense, so I'm not being an ableist when I say this country is, 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 is mentally ill. Yeah. Um, and we, we sit through trauma, through what we've done to ourselves. Yeah. Because nobody's attacked this country ever. Well, unless you're Native American and indigenous and and yes, then it's been attacked. But after the constitution was formed, this country hasn't really been attacked. There was Pearl Harbor, but that was in Hawaii. Um so if we look at it like we did this to ourselves, is what I'm saying. Yeah, and you know there are also um, different activists. Uh, the Black Alliance for Peace is among them, prominently, who always connect all of these uh, domestic policies to our foreign policy as well, and show how they also mirror each other, and how we've always treated certain populations uh, here in the United States is a reflection of how we treat people around the world, you know, from our 800 military bases and with our defense, you know, quote, defense budget, which is the largest in in the world by far. Yes. And to bring this back to the union stuff, too, is like a lot of I hear a lot of people say, well, my union doesn't do anything for me. Well, neither does your president and neither does your senator. And neither does your mayor. You have to do it. It shouldn't matter who is in office as long as they're accountable to the people. And the way we keep accountability is we keep pressure on them. We might see Donald Trump as as much as a, of a tyrant as he is change when there's enough pressure put on him. And so we have we are a very lazy country. Um, but also, we work too much. We're lazy when it comes to things outside of work. But as far as work goes, I mean, we're grunts. We don't, and it's set, the system's set up that way. You know, it, you're too busy to take time off. You're told not to take the time off. You, you, you think you have to save your vacation pay in case you get fired um, or you have a medical emergency. Uh, so there's never any time to participate. I mean, uh, I'm very lucky that I have a job and I go to work and I'm able to do my job online right now, but I work all day and then I go to the protest at night and it takes me an hour to get back home from the protest and stuff. That's really hard to sustain um, and still have a work-life balance, still have time with family. I have a seven-month-old grandchild and an eight-year-old grandchild, and I hardly ever see them anymore. Um, and so I think we really, poor people need to stop fighting with each other. Working people need to stop fighting with each other. Um, we need to really look at the systems that have oppressed all of us. There's only like 10 people who are succeeding in this country who are okay and are having a good time. 10. You need to eat those people. You <laughs> distribute that money. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> well, that's, that's great. I feel like you, you gave us a really, uh, a pretty good idea of the things that you've been seeing. Um, at the at the protest in Portland, I really like how you connected in the union organizing with all of that and your experience with that. And um, I know that you also mentioned that you have worked on documentaries before. I wanted you to to say a little bit about about that too. Oh, okay. So um, 
I have been, I guess, out lead by since junior high. Um, so it's been a long time, but it wasn't a safe space for me. I grew up in Boise, Idaho. Oh, um, yeah. In my formative years, um, I saw friends that were attacked on a regular basis. Um, so, I mean, I was out with my friends, but I wasn't, like, I didn't wear a sign. Um, but I, uh, I was, I had just, I, I had lost my union job in, I had had a heart attack in California. I was just working 90 hours a week. It was stupid. Oh gosh. Um, and I had to go home. Um, my husband got a job in Idaho, uh, his old job back. So I didn't want to go. I always say like Idaho sucks because I always end up back there. Uh Um, but I ended up back there with him and it was December, 2014. And I was watching the news and I was watching my friends getting arrested. Um, and still after all this time, I graduated high school in 1983 and they still hadn't added the words sexual orientation or gender identity into the human rights act which means in Idaho and in 27 other states and in 35 picking one or the other, but 27 still have both uh, discriminatory practices are legal where you can fire someone or refuse them service. If you are, uh, if someone is gay or transgender um, or doesn't fit within the binaries um, outside of the LGBTQ plus community. Right. So you can literally, I, you know, you'll hear people say, well, you know, get a job. It's like, well, not only can you not get a job in Idaho if you're gay or transgender, um, you can be refused food when you go to the grocery store or you can be refused gas if you go to the gas station. We're not talking about a cake here. We're talking about people lives. And now that the ambulance companies are no longer public, um, they private ambulance companies can refuse to resuscitate or work on people who are gay or transgender. Um, so uh, they don't take the, the Hippocratic oath. So um, I don't think people understand how bad it was. So I went, um, I called a friend of mine who's a really good filmmaker, and I said, come down and capture some footage with me. I think I want to make a short. And he was like hemmed and hawed. He's a straight white guy. He's like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> so we went down, and um, we it was like all-out war. It was amazing. Um Add the word organizers had done a fantastic job. Um, Nicole Favor was just amazing. She was, you know, the first state senator who uh, was openly gay, um, represented the North End downtown. And, you know, she was one of the leaders that put this together. They'd been trying for 10 years to get just a hearing in a committee to add the words and couldn't even get that. So they were standing in the halls with their hands over their mouths because they had been silenced for so long and they would stand there all day and uh, the police would come and arrest them. And, um, but they shut that Capitol down that whole session. The lawmakers couldn't get any laws passed and it was amazing. And the fortitude of the people who showed up and the allies and, just it was amazing what was happening every morning, you know, um, finding out where people were going. And we were in there filming, and uh, it ended up being a full length documentary. I think it's fantastic. Uh, one of the, I'm really proud of it. One of the pieces for me uh, that was really important too was that the, the guy that I had partnered with for this. Uh, went from not really caring, being very uncomfortable around the transgender women that I had picked to 
talk to because she was your average looking uh, suburban, you know, uh, she just looks like, you know, she, she was older when she transitioned. And so she's not going to be somebody who's able to have like all of the, the surgery to make herself as beautiful as Caitlyn Jenner or anything, but she has this soul that's just, it comes out, she's such a gorgeous, powerful woman. I love her so much, Diane Piggott. Um, but he didn't want to use her because she didn't look right. Huh. But I love Diane because she's so charming that you just fall in love with her. And I thought her voice was so much more important, things like that. So he ended up, um, his family, not his mom, his mom was really supportive, but like on his dad's side of the family and stuff, they were horrified that he was part of this project. And they were literally calling him, telling him, if you continue to do this, uh, we're not going to be part of your family anymore. And, um, and he, it just made him more about getting in there and getting this documentary. You know, he, he went the right way. And uh, he really then got enthusiastic about it and stuff. And so I think we made a really good film. We, uh, it's, in the, our, it's in the Director's Guild archives as an important piece of work uh, in Los Angeles. We were able to show it out fest. And we got, like, first runner-up for the um, Audience Choice Awards. And uh, we... Got first runner up in almost every film festival that we went to. That's great. <laughs> Which was amazing because it was my first documentary and first full length feature film that I had ever made as a director and a producer. So that was interesting. That's awesome. What's it called? Um, add the word. Add the word. It's add, adding the word sexual orientation and gender identity into the Human Rights Act in Idaho. It should be federal. You know, we should add that into the Civil Rights Act, and we haven't done that yet. So, didn't we're the still Supreme, othering people. Didn't the Supreme Court <laughs> recently find that, that that was somehow included, however? Didn't they say this in early June with that case that they had? Yes. Yeah, so, um, yes. It, but it still doesn't include... Um, biases from religious organizations and stuff like uh, that. And, mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's still, it's a hard thing to prove, you know, that you're being discriminated against because uh, you're gay or transgender. That's a hard thing to prove. Right. Um, you know, because they can give a list of other reasons. But, yeah, I just, I was really proud of, uh, like, the young women now in that are working on now the words like Chelsea Lincoln and Bleacher and uh, Evangeline Bleacher are doing incredible work there. They're so young, so dynamic and just really smart and strategic women. Um, I think that again, looking to women of color to lead this country is going to save us all. Frankly, <laughs> the rest of us don't know how to navigate it. We failed. <laughs> yeah, I'll go with that one. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. Great. Well, is uh, is there anything else that you wanted to to, to add? I mean, that was that you. Wow, that you kind of summed it up well there at the end. Can I give a shout out to a couple of people? Let me give a shout out to my sisters who've been on the front lines down in uh, Portland every night. I love them. Um, they're representing when I can't be there. I, I think they're awesome. Pinika and Kirsten are their names. But I also really want to give a shout out to my friend Lisa Bourgeois. Um, we've been friends for years. I met her when we were working to get the ACA passed. Uh, she's a black woman real estate agent who uh, was a leader in the community leading the banks to stop redlining certain districts like Five Points in Denver. She was amazing. I love her so much. Um, but she would get on the boards of these banks and they would say, what do we need to do to help black people? And she's like, 
We don't need special programs, just put a goddamn bank up in our neighborhood. Um, and she was very strategic, and she really taught me a lot about um, what it meant being a white woman in this country, uh, what the black experience for her was, and um, really how I, I talk about race relations and stuff comes from her mouth. So I want to give her those props. (laughs) Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.